I have a very vivid memory of sitting alone in my bedroom and almost saying to myself, there is something very wrong with me. It was like a sudden, very vivid awareness. It was something almost intangible, but I felt it very strongly within me. It felt very much like I was living in black and white while the rest of the world was living in colour. It's strange, I've never ever felt like I belonged anywhere at school, amid friends or teachers or in the classroom or at home. I always felt once, twice removed from people. I've gone through periods of binging and purging to periods of extreme restriction of food intake. Sometimes I would have nothing at all in a day. I did want to reduce myself in size, but it, it wasn't to fit my clothes, it, it, it wasn't to look good, it was to disappear. It was to take up less space in the world. I wanted to become invisible. I became incredibly good at adopting a mask to the outside world because it was the only way of really existing in it. I had to present a face that was compatible with the rest of the world. I became almost a master at projecting this image of myself. If you had been in my head or in my skin, what you would have heard or seen would have been, I am terrified. I can't stand to live in my skin and I'm so alone and I don't know how to voice this. And yet, no one can see it. When I began to resort to sleeping to cope, then it began to feel like rather than it being my decision, the sleep began to control me and I would literally feel drugged. Couldn't for the life of me keep my eyes open or keep my head up. Quite often very violent nightmares. Over and over walking to the top of the stairs in our old house and throwing myself down and the impact at the bottom never being violent enough. And so I would have to climb back up the stairs and hurl myself down again, over and over and over again, all night for years. I dreamt the same thing. With awareness comes a taking of responsibility. Wanting to die and kill myself was just so simple. It's the not wanting, it's the d deciding that actually I want to, to live and and give this my best shot, that is so much more difficult. Well, when I was about, I'd say about 12, about 12, 13, like my mum started noticing I was doing things over and over again. I, I didn't think, I didn't know what it was, I just thought I was a bit weird. I just thought I liked things the way I liked them. The worst, the worst thing was, was leaving the house. Because I had, like, I had to check everything before I left, I used to go upstairs, check every window in my room, check all the plugs, and then go into the next room, check all the windows and all the plugs, go into the bathroom, check the windows, the taps, and anything that could like cause a hazard. And then I went into my mum's room, I'd do all the same things, and it would just, I'd be every room every morning. And then I'd leave, and I'd have to stand there for about, it could last about two hours, checking the door, just constantly going like that. I'd walk off and I'd come back. And once I actually got all the way to school, and I was sitting there on my lesson, I went, the door. And I had to go home. I had to go and tell my teacher, I said, look, I've got to go home, I've got to go home. I called my mum, I was like, mum, I think I've left the door open. She's like, you haven't, you know you haven't. I was like, 
oh, but I have to check. I had to go all the way back. Eight. That's all I can say. Eight's the number. That's my only number I like, the only number I trust. I like even numbers. Even though some numbers like at six even, I don't like it because it's it's made up of two threes. Everything had to be in eights. I used to tap my teeth as well. Eight. I went through stages of blinking and I used to have to blink eight times at a certain thing and look at another thing and blink eight times. It was on the telly as well. I had to blink at people's eyes. I had to look at their eyes and blink eight times. There was a strong part of me that believed in it too much. But there was another part of me in my head. There was the normal me who was saying, stop being so stupid. It, it's ridiculous. It really is so stupid. I, I used to argue with myself, just stop. And sometimes you just can't. And it's like, it's not like there's a little voice in your head saying, oh, you've got to do this. It's just like, there's someone there, mate, they're pushing you, and they're pushing you, and they're pushing you. And they're like, it's like someone's injecting these thoughts into your head, saying, you've got to do it again. Or this will happen, or that will blow up, or that's going to catch on fire. When I was younger, right, through like early teens, when I used to go to bed, I used to be really scared. Because even though I knew everything's shut and everything, I used to be scared that someone was still going to get in and do harm to me or my mum. There's people out there that they don't want to admit they've got it, they don't know they've got it, and they think they're weird. But they're not. They just need to, they need someone to help them and they need to understand why they like it, what's wrong with them, and try and cope with it. I think when uh, I started primary school, I think then is when I first noticed that I was really different from everyone else. Mm -hmm. I found that people would be playing games, just wouldn't understand why they'd have this want or desire to do it. And so I'd just be walking around on the playgrounds on those little lines in my coat just because it was more interesting to me than watching or playing these games of chase and whatever. I guess the reason why it felt very odd watching all these other people play was because of their body language and their facial expressions. It just, to me, it didn't make sense. And so I'd spend time watching and observing and trying to figure it out. And to me, it was as obscure as hieroglyphs. The bullying always carried on, always got worse. Um, and at year six, I was thinking, primary school's over, secondary school, new start, new people, maybe I can do well there. Maybe it's all gonna stop, it's all gonna be good. But, there, I very quickly realised things weren't going to be good. By the first day, I was being bullied. I was often seen as just that very weird boy who is odd. I'd learnt the um, school rules off by heart. For instance, we had um, a one-way corridor, and even if my classroom was just two metres in, I still wouldn't let myself do that. I'd go all the way around which would take me an extra couple of minutes because I just thought I cannot break this rule. What I had to do uh, when I met someone was to build up um, what I like to call an equation uh, for their personality. So I used this equation to build a, uh, a mask, if you like, uh, in which to speak through so that I can interact with this person well. It's knowing when someone has finished talking and they want you to talk. I leave a huge long pause until we're sure that they wanted me to talk, which usually was until they were giving me a weird look. And only then would I start talking. I'll be hearing every single uh, pen or pencil scribbling at different times, at different speeds, at different pressures. I'll be hearing the cars and the buses outside, noticing aeroplanes going past, trains going past. People on the street, what are they talking about? Where are they from? What can I tell from this conversation? And I'll just be having all of this input going into my head. School became a full-blown phobia, in a sense. I just could not deal with um, the emotional impact. I mean, I was having nightmares night after night about school and about being bullied. The sad thing is that 
what was happening in my nightmares was what was going on in real life. So I couldn't even have any escape in my dreams. I think the first time I self-harmed, I found a needle in my room and I just drew it across my skin. And I remember the sight of blood and feeling like I had discovered something. It was a relief. I had found something that could help me, almost. I guess I was trying to cut away a part of myself. I was trying to kill the monster inside. Sometimes I just wanted to see blood and see my skin and know I was still alive because one of the things I struggled with is feeling unreal and feeling like I wasn't human or I wasn't part of the world. I have burned myself with a cigarette, I've burned myself with my straighteners. Burned myself with anything from a heated piece of metal or um, cigarettes were another very common one. So I would head bang, I would use needles and um, just press them into my skin as far as they would go. I bruised myself, I scratched myself. I punched the wall, I'd trap my arm in the door, I'd throw myself downstairs and that pain, even though it hurt, I liked it because it was almost a physical pain detracted from the emotional pain and it made me forget all about it. Literally, sometimes I will feel this desperate need to tear off my skin because I cannot stand to sit in it. And it's, it's the most torturous feeling of being trapped in yourself because there is absolutely no escape. And yeah, sometimes self-harming gives that illusion of, of breaking out, almost. Every scar has a meaning and it. it's like a sketchbook when I look at them because it's so much on the same arm and they cross over so many times and it is like they tell a story. When I self-harm, it's like you're in a scary film and you finally come to the end where something happy happens and you're OK again. People cry. I can't cry. My blood is my tears because I can't cry. There's no way for me to show emotion that isn't self-harm and I wish there was.